Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, I'm here with my good friend Chris. He's actually an intern at Facebook. He's also interned at other companies like Lyft and Bloomberg. And uh, we're gonna be talking about how to land a software engineering internship. Yeah. This is the second part of a two part video. The first part is on Chris's channel. So the link is in the description down below. And over there we covered like what these internships are, how to pass the interviews and prepare for the interviews uh, to land these internships. But now we're gonna talk about the natural next question, which is how do you actually land the interviews? So Chris, you've done a ton of these internships now. You clearly have mastered the art of landing software engineering internships. Trying. How did you go about getting the interviews? Yeah, so I think it usually comes down to a few main things that everyone pretty much resorts to. There's online applications, personal referrals, which are usually the most effective way to go, but you know, hard to get a lot of them, especially for people going for internships, career fairs, tech talks, networking events, and anything that is offered at a college campus, and then just cold emailing and reaching out to people through various mediums. I think that if I were to rank all these things, yes, yes I would say, Referrals, and by the way, referrals, for those of you who might not know, is when you have someone who works at the company, they sort of apply on your behalf, but that is probably the most effective way just because you have someone at the company who's vouching for you, right? They're saying like, I know this person, they would be good to work at there. Uh, the key thing there is that like, you need to actually know the person fairly well. Based on my experience, a lot of companies, when you're, when you're referring someone, whether it's a full-time engineer or an intern, they ask you like, in what capacity have you worked with this person? What type of work have you done? Like, what do you know about them? Ideally, you know someone who's like a close friend or a close former coworker. Is that, does that sound yeah, accurate? Pretty Pretty much, pretty much. Um, for referrals, I would just ask people that I've literally worked on projects with in my classes. Someone who works at a company is giving their word that knowing the company standards because they're there, they can vouch for this other person. So obviously it's going to be the most effective in terms of getting a high response rate and the highest probability of being seen, but you're gonna get less exposure to a lot of companies because you can only get so many referrals. You can only know so exactly. many people. So it is a trade-off between getting a high response rate and a high success rate and getting a lot of exposure. And then in between is that gray area where you kind of have to be creative. Yeah. Showing up to events and getting to know people, reaching out to people and opening up conversations via email, asking people that you know, people that people you know know, and just trying to get seen and get your resume out there. And I want to talk about those events, right? Like mm -hmm. career yeah. fairs and all that, because especially those events that are organized by a university or a college, and ideally, you know, the university that you're attending, you've got these companies that are specifically coming to your college, right, to recruit you. So right. take advantage of university career fairs if you haven't already, or if you have the opportunity to do so. The other point that you mentioned, Chris, was this whole thing about like cold emails, right? Sending emails to either recruiters or friends of friends and yeah, things like yeah. that. These I think can also be really useful. This is actually how I started my yes, interview definitely. process at Google. I found a recruiter on LinkedIn. They happened to have their email, right, their corporate email in their like LinkedIn profile. I emailed them, expressed interest, and I wrote sort of a, you know, short and sweet email, but that conveys like who you are, your background, why you would the elevator fit, pitch, yeah. right? Hey, I'd love to start the interview process, you know, if possible. And that recruiter actually got back to me. It's not that you're going to get 100% success with that type of, you know, approach, but I think you can get better success than by just applying online. Right, right. Because when you're applying for these internships, it tends to be like a competition between you and the rest of the applicant pool. And any opportunity to narrow down the applicant pool you're compared against is going to give you a better success rate. And it's also, I think you just mentioned, like you're definitely going to be seen. It's about yeah. you're putting yourself in front of the eyes of a human being. With the referral, you know you're going to be seen. Right, right. At a career fair, you're actually talking to a recruiter and sort of like getting into the system right then and there. Right, right. I would go to career fairs, iron out my elevator pitch and just get attention, and then try to just have a genuine conversation with the recruiter or the engineer. Try to talk about what their work is, what the company is doing, and their interests. That would make it more personal. And I think that the more personal and proactive you can be, the better, because it makes the recruiter's job easier. Like the common thread in everything that you've been saying is yeah. that it's really about cultivating and building and growing a network of people, right? Yes, a network of, of people in the industry, whether they be your friends, can be your future coworkers or recruiters, right? 
And the more you grow your network, the easier it's going to be to sort of like get your foot in the door in various different places. So let's talk about the resume. So I think there are a few things that are really essential to making a good resume that a lot of college students miss. The first thing is that a lot of college students will assume that applying for internships is like college applications where you assume that you're going to get attention and that someone is going to read through your application all the way through and resumes should be thought of more like Vine, YouTube, TikTok, and like social media than it is like college applications because you want to grab attention for as long as possible. It's like recruiters spend three to 10 seconds at most looking at your resume and it's basically a battle between you and their attention span. There are a few components to that. One is to make sure there's no repeated information on your resume. Like if you communicate something about you in like the skills section or the education section, you don't need to mention that in every single experience listing. Another thing I think is important is aesthetic cohesiveness. This isn't really content based, but in terms of like the styling of your resume, you don't want a million different fonts, a million different sizes, different types of header, subheader formats across your resume. It needs to be pretty clear what you're trying to get across. To your point about like grabbing their attention, that's why I think it's also really important to really highlight things that you are proud of. Let's take you, Chris, right? Mm -hmm. On your resume, you should definitely have in a very prominent place that you interned at Facebook, that you interned at Lyft, right? These are like big things that will grab the attention. Or if you, if right. you, you know, you are a computer science student, maybe put that there, right? You have a bachelor's degree or you are working towards a bachelor's degree at such and such university. Right. And first of all, it needs to be one page, okay? Please don't write a novel about your life experiences. This isn't really the time to flex how cool you are as a person. This is just to say, hey, this is my key selling point. Pay attention to me. You can probably communicate the rest when you're interviewing. Once you have your few select bullet points or your few key experiences, projects, courses highlighted, you don't need to write a novel about each of them. I think the most important thing to communicate is impact and purpose. That's why you often see like people say, you know, let's say at an internship or, you know, in a club or whatever, increase productivity by X percent or increased speed of, you know, loading speed of a web page by uh, Y percent, right? These kinds of things kind of convey a bit more tangible, objective impact rather than worked as part of a team doing that. Any type of metrics first, right on the first line, just throw that out there. Um, and then anything else that ends up being useful to people, put that next. And then after that, emphasize the technologies you've worked with. Even if it's something as simple as a personal website, I wouldn't suggest saying, I wrote in HTML, CSS, and Python, and I used these UI components. I think first you should communicate why you're making this. I think you, you, you sort of address that a little bit, side projects. Yeah. Side projects are important when you're, especially when you're applying for an internship or maybe your first full-time job because you might not have as much work experience or internship experience as other people. You might have none. So having projects on your resume can be really important. Uh, did you have any projects on your resume? It's interesting actually, because I did not work on actual personal projects before landing my first positions. I mainly was just so focused on my courses and I actually just sold my course projects on my resume. And I tried to do uh, personal projects or I tried to get in that process, but I just didn't want to do them on my own because I realized the overall productivity and impact I would make on my own would not be nearly as effective as it would be with a team. So I started reaching out right. to people in my classes and people that I knew and in the process, I found someone that was working a part-time job and I reached out to their manager and just went in and talked about positions they were hiring for. And I ended up landing my first part-time developer position as a Salesforce developer there. And I realized that any time I would be spending on personal projects would probably be better spent on actual industry work because there's more opportunity for impact. But that's a great example of how you sort of like leverage your network yeah, yeah, and definitely. sort of like you, you, it sounds like you just had a very scrappy approach to like getting stuff done and getting to where you want it to be. Like that was a great, yeah. like props to you for having done that and for having landed that first sort of mini internship or, or part-time job that then served itself 
as a replacement for a personal project because it was work experience. Yeah, definitely. I think that a key thing that I learned to do, I think it's a term that people use in trading, like in the stock market or in crypto, is locking in profits and moving on to the next thing. So a lot of people will spend a lot of time just focusing on the learning and the actual working on personal projects until eventually they feel like a CS legend and that companies would just be immediately interested in them. And that does work for a lot of people. I didn't find that very effective for me. I basically thought, what's the most effective way to become a software engineer? What's the one thing I can do that makes everything on the way easier or unnecessary? It's kind of a quote that I got from uh, this book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. I highly recommend it. The most effective thing was getting an internship. What's the one thing I can do to get an internship? It's have a project or have a job. So what's the one thing I can do to get that? And it was just find people that are already doing that and kind of just ride that wave. If you do go down the personal project route, in my opinion, having projects that are sort of very uh, visible and very easy to understand is important. So like for mm -hmm. me, the projects that I had were all very similar. They were all visualization tools for algorithms and you could click on it and you could like do things with your mouse and you would be able to visualize sorting algorithms like quick sort or merge sort or graph traversal algorithms like depth for search and dijkstra's algorithm i think those were just good projects because like you quickly get what they are. Yeah, yeah, They're definitely. very visual. It just works, you know? So yeah, overall, to get an interview, you just gotta have at least one thing that gets a recruiter's attention just enough to convince them that you add value and to consider you for an interview. So this will either be a side project, class projects, or a very niche type of work experience. And you will have to get your foot in the door somehow, applying online, career fairs, exploit all of your college campus recruiting events. A combination of different approaches that make trade-offs between getting exposure and getting really personal with a recruiter. Yep, exactly. And Chris sort of summed it up perfectly. Thank you so much for doing this collaboration with me, Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I hope you all enjoyed this. I hope you could get a nugget of wisdom from this video. And uh, I'll see you in the next one.